I, 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 really, I prayed about it over the last month and just was really uh, just seeking the Lord. Lord, where do you want us to go in the Bible? And I wanted us to stay with a book of the Bible. I wanted us, just like we did James, where we walked, we walked verse by verse through the book of James. And I love that you guys learned to be students as well. So like last week, Lonnie did something that I do routinely when I'm preparing a message is, is I'll break it down into key words, key phrases, and I, I'll keep peeling away layer after layer. What does this mean? What are the, what are the truths? What are the nuggets that I can find in it? Because when you read fast, you don't get the nuggets. It's when you read, when you read fast, you get the overarching thought, but when you read slow and you pull apart word by word, phrase by phrase, you see the deep nuggets. And so I love that we did that through James. But what I recognize is sometimes our, our biblical literacy, we don't always flow through the whole scripture. Maybe we know a portion or a section of the history of this book well and another part we don't know well we know genesis pretty well i think i think most of us know the book of genesis pretty well but then once you get past that a lot of the times our knowledge breaks down and so that's why i wanted us to pick up in the book of exodus and i don't know if this will take us 12 weeks or 20 weeks i'm not certain it might take us 30 weeks but we're going to walk through it and we're going to see what does God have for us in Exodus? And I will challenge you. I believe God has stuff for us to learn even through these Old Testament books. Even through stories written about people that have been dead for, for centuries and centuries. God still has stuff for us to learn through these books. And so um, I, I, I kind of wanted that subheading to be like that we are drawn out, drawn in. That when I look at the book of Exodus, it is God drawing them out of slavery and God drawing them, propelling them into a new life. And I couldn't have designed this better if I tried. I love that, that we start this on Juneteenth. I don't know if you understand or know, Car Carla would because you're from Texas, but Juneteenth really is, it would be the, it would be the fulfillment of July 4th almost is what some historians talk about. I will tell you this. This was last week. I was in a I was in a group setting with some community leaders and there was these two men and they were talking about yeah, next week's Juneteenth. And I watched them and they rolled their eyes at each other. And I thought, "Oh, that made me sad." It I like I literally felt sad that they rolled their eyes. It was um, and, I, and I think some of it is just born of ignorance, that they don't really understand the significance. I, I celebrate this day. I, I think that we should. I, I celebrate the freedom that I have in Jesus daily. But I still, I love that the beauty of the meaning of Juneteenth is that, that I think it was like nearly two and a half years after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, nearly two and a half years before the troops rode into Galveston, it was Galveston, wasn't it? Into Galveston and announced to those, to the slaves that you are actually free. So it was, the, the freedom was signed into existence several years ago, but it took, it took over 24 months for them to understand the message. How beautiful is that? That is the Christian faith, that Jesus purchased our freedom. He signed the document. But how many people are still living as slaves to sin? The, the meaning, the beauty of it, if you're like me and you have family that are mixed race, like, I, like I am for this holiday. I am. I, it was two months. I don't think it was two months. Two it was, it was. Okay. From what I know, it was, it was a few years after that before it was known to everybody so anyways I I just I celebrate the day because I think I think Imago Day means something that we are all made in the image of God he made us all to be free people he created and and, and just the beauty that he signed our freedom like scripture says in the New Testament he purchased our freedom and forgave us our sins 
that we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his, his dear son who purchased our freedom, forgave us of our sins. But how many people are still living in bondage because they don't know that they've been set free. They don't know that the document is signed and freedom was purchased for them. So I love the idea that we're starting, and I didn't do it on purpose. I, I, I wasn't that creative. But Exodus is literally the story of God rescuing his people out of slavery, out of slavery. And so we're going to begin tonight, kind of the format that we're going to try to do tonight is we're going to try to walk through just this one paper. This is literally just the introduction to Exodus. I'm not going to read any of the verses in Exodus tonight. We're going to dive deep into that next week. But tonight, we want to lay good groundwork. We want to we want to set the scene for where we're going for the book of Exodus so that we really can dig deep next week. And so I, I'd like us to start with prayer. We're going to walk through this. And if we have time, we will end with um, the Bible Project video. There's two videos that cover the book of Exodus, and they're just done so well. So let's start with prayer. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you purchased our freedom and you forgave us of our sins. And tonight, Lord, like yesterday and then tomorrow, we celebrate our freedom. We thank you that because of you, we are free. And Lord, we recognize that there are people all over this world, all over Union and Franklin County, that are not walking in the freedom that you purchased for them. Lord, they're still living as slaves to their own sin. Would you help us to be faithful to proclaim the freedom that you purchased for them? Lord, tonight I ask that you would help us to have hearts that would receive your word and ears that would hear, um, eyes that would see, hearts that would understand so that we would be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. my main idea. Your, if you look through your Bible, if you have a study Bible, you will have in the front of every book um, a summary. You'll have a synopsis. It'll say who wrote it, when did they write it, who was it written to, what's the big theme. So as I was preparing today and I was thinking, Lord, in my own words, not someone else's words, my own words, what's the big theme of Exodus? It's God drew his people out of slavery so he could draw them into relationship. He drew them out of slavery so that he could draw them into relationship. By the way, right now, my girl Ruby is teaching in Washington. I, you just can't even understand how cool that is for me that while I'm leading you here, she's leading the body there. And my, I just had to share, like my heart's just so glad to think of my girl uh, teaching God's word. So that, to me, is the, the main idea of the book of Exodus. Granted, it's not, it, it could be so much more nuanced. There's so much more to it. But in one succinct sentence, it's an out so he can draw men into relationship. How do we get here, though? So why am I not starting in Genesis? Because, like I said, we generally know the story of Genesis. When anyone starts a Bible reading plan, they start in Genesis. As, as having taught kids and teenagers for years and years, when I would teach through the Bible, I would teach with that, that key word model, where I would teach one key word, one action to go with it. And so anytime I've thought Genesis, I've always taught these key words. So where we say, how did we get here in a word? Here's what I did. I did creation, fall, flood, nations. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Boom. That's the book of Genesis in one word bites. And so I always did these actions. So here's what I did. I did creation, fall, flood, nations. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Does that make sense? All in. So, so when I would teach uh, chronologically through the Bible, that was such a good word picture of a visual picture and because I've taught that and had those actions I know it like anyone tell me the the story of Genesis boom creation fall flood nations Abraham Isaac Jacob Joseph boom that's the end so would you guys do this with me all right so here we go we're gonna say
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. I do Abraham, Isaac, Jacob because, I don't know, I could do Abraham like a beard, you know, but what do you do for Isaac? What do you do for Jacob? Liar. I could do a long nose for Jacob because he was a liar and a, and a cheat. But generally, when we read through scripture, you'll notice it's the trio of names. The God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then I do this for Joseph because they ended in Egypt and they ended as slaves. What, Corey? Say that again. Wakanda forever. Wakanda forever. All right. That's a Star Wars? No, not Star Wars. I don't know Wakanda, or I don't care. <laughs> so do you guys see how simple you can get through the book of Genesis? Creation, fall, the fall of man, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. That's how we get to Exodus. <laughs> Black Panther, okay. That's how we get to Exodus. Exodus, and I love this, it's so succinct. Exodus 1 covers the next 400 years of history. Exodus, just in one chapter, and we'll, we'll dig into that. Exodus 1 covers 400 years of history. Exodus 2, 3, and 4 covers 80 years of Moses' life from, from the beginning to the time he's 80 years old till he flees, till he's on the lamb. Chapter 6 through 18 may only cover just a few short months. And then Exodus 19 through 40 covers about a year. Now, if you'll notice in Scripture, not every season of time, every period of time is given the same weight of importance. And that's okay. Because in my life, not every season of time is given the same amount of weight and importance. So let's talk through the highlights, some special features of Exodus. Exodus may be the most central book to understanding the rest of the Old Testament. If you really want to understand the rest of the Old Testament, you need to understand the book of Exodus. You don't skip Exodus. The name Exodus literally means to exit or depart. Because they departed, they exited their slavery in Egypt. Moses is the central figure in the Old Testament. Even more central than Abraham, I would say. Abraham may be the patriarch of the Jewish faith. But Moses, I mean, think about the law rests on Moses. Moses is the one who is literally leading them out towards the promised land. The bondage of Egypt is symbolic of all bondage in the Old Testament. I'm going to read through these quick. If you've got something to add, just shout me down. We, I, I kind of want to walk through this fast. The Passover, remember the Passover meal, the Passover when the death angel comes through, the Passover becomes the image of salvation for both Jews and Christians. The Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb. The Passover becomes the central celebration of the Jewish faith, even all the way to the New Testament and the Gospels. When Jesus is celebrating the Passover meal, all of this goes back to Exodus. You're seeing why Exodus is so central in understanding the rest of Scripture. Jesus celebrated this same thing. The meeting with God at Mount Sinai when Moses climbs the mountain of God, right? It establishes the concept of the rule of law and the Old Testament law. The rule, it, it just literally establishes that there is law and that this is the Old Testament law, which we know as the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments are no, they're not obsolete. They're not just an Old Testament framework. Now in the New Testament, Jesus himself says there's two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You take those two, create an umbrella. Every one of those Ten Commandments fits right under it. You know, why does he do that? Because what can you, if you follow those two, you follow the ten. Am I right? Yep. If, you are, if you are loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're not taking his name in vain. You're, you're going to honor the Sabbath. If you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to kill them. <laughs> you don't take their spouse. Right? Everything, all ten of those fall under the two that Jesus says. So all Jesus does is he's saying, I'm boiling it all down and making it a little bit simpler. 
We can love them and not always be nice, right? We are going to work on being nice, yes. Nice. Love, is, love is patient, love is kind. And so we're going to work on kindness. The meeting with God at Mount Sinai introduces all Israel to Yahweh. Think about this. For 400 years, the people of God, his chosen people, have lived in slavery in Egypt, not knowing the God of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, dead and gone years and years later. So for 400 years, Joseph dies. Joseph dies. For 400 years, they're enslaved, and their they're, they're customs that they're seeing all around them are pagan customs, which I cannot wait till we get to the plagues. Not because I like talking about blood, gnats, and frogs, but because I love the cultural idea that Jesus is, is using their own cultural gods to say, just like remember when we talked about the I am statements, the, that Demeter says, I'm the God of, of grain. And Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. And, and Zeus is the God of light and thunder and lightning. And Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. That goes all the way back to the Old Testament when God is using these 10 plagues in their own cultural settings. And so I, I'm excited for that. So now here in Exodus, Yahweh is introduced to the people of God. These people that for 400 years have been enslaved in a nation that wasn't their own. And now they get to be introduced to Yahweh. It, we get from this instructions for worship based on the tabernacle form um, all, that form all Jewish and Christian worship. They're introduced to a tabernacle. They didn't, they didn't have a tabernacle before. They're introduced to different for, uh, a new form of worship. They're introduced to sacrificial worship even. We see the glory of God. We see the glory of God, of the Lord, filling the tabernacle, how it closes Exodus as the climax of God's work. If you read the last tiny chunk of Exodus, it ends. God has established the new tabernacle, not the temple yet, but the tabernacle, that the tent where his glory dwelt. He establishes it. He gives them all the guidelines, shows them how to build it, what to do. And the very end of Exodus, so beautiful. We end with the glory of God resting upon the tabernacle. I, I can't even wait to get there. So look, let's look at this. Why Exodus? Why for us? Why now? Exodus is about community, a community of believers growing, struggling, sacrificing, and moving. I think that's applicable for us now, don't you? How do we do life with each other? It's about a community of believers learning to take steps of faith. Y'all, walk it through the Red Sea? Come on. If that isn't a step of faith, I don't know what is. I'm going to tell you, I know my level of faith. I, and you probably know yours too. Moses holding the staff and the waters parting and even the ground drying. I still would have hurried along through the Red Sea. I still would have been pushing and nudging my way forward, walking through and seeing a wall of water on both sides of me. These people are learning to live in community and learning to grow their faith. Such a beautiful thing. They're learning to be a community of believers following a vision by faith, a vision. They're learning to be a group of people following a leader, a new guy, a new guy in town who walks in and he stutters and he has to have his brother be his mouth mouthpiece for him. They're learning to follow this guy that's that's seemingly lost in the desert. Like these are people learning how to follow a vision, how to walk in faith. They're people learning how to set up a new place of worship. They're people meeting God in this new place of worship. Exodus is about, listen to this, it's about a community of believers learning to love God and love each other. That's us. Why is Exodus important for us? Because we are a community of people learning how to love God and love each other. This is important for us. It's a book for everyone. It reminds us 
this is my thought. It reminds us that by seeing God's faithful patience towards Israel and Exodus, we can have confidence. Because he saw them, he sees us. Because he heard them, I know that he hears me. Because he guided them, I can have confidence that he guides me. Because he knew them. Aren't you thankful to know that you can have confidence that he knows you? And oh my goodness, if that wasn't enough, because he loved them, I can have confidence that he loves me. Because I know that he loved complaining, wandering idol worshipers, I can have confidence to know that he loves me. Hey, Adam, right up here, buddy, is some papers. So what else do we see? In Exodus, we learn that. Here's some things that we learn. We learn that blessings are often temporary. Oh, and I want to be, I, I always want to be faithful to give credit where credit is due. Pastor Paul um, preached a message on Wednesday nights years ago. I, I can't even recall what the date on his paper was. So he preached a series of messages years ago, and I think it lasted him for like 51 weeks. I'm pretty sure we're not going to be 51 weeks. I don't think so. I don't know. But some of the thoughts, like I sat down and I've kind of read through his thoughts, and so some of my thoughts are like, why would I re reinvent a wheel if someone else has made a wheel and interpreted something so well? So, so these last thoughts, these are Pastor Paul, and he says that blessings are often temporary. What do we learn? Blessings are often temporary. The blessing where they ended in Egypt was a blessing. The blessing ended in slavery, but it was a blessing because that them being in Egypt, they were rescued by their brother Joseph. They were spared from from starvation because there was a famine in the land. But what we learn is that blessings are, off, blessings are often temporary. We learn that situations change. God remains the same though. Israel had grown large enough to be a threat to Egypt. Their situation changed. They get to Egypt and remember Joseph says, just tell them what you do. They'll put you, I think they were in the land of Goshen. Like, the Egyptians won't want anything to do with you because they know that you're, you're shepherds. They don't respect shepherds. Like their situation changed though over the years and they grew and they grew like, like I remember I told you I have words and I will draw in my Bible. I drew a, a rabbit next to parts of uh, the very first part of Exodus 1 because the nation of Israel grew and they flourished like rabbits because rabbits just multiplied. There's a bunny in one of my Bibles. I don't, no shame in that. Did, what else do we see and learn? Difficulties train. They train us. The harshness of slavery prepared Israel for several things. It, the harshness of slavery, what they experienced for 400 years in Egypt they got calluses, so to speak. Harsh conditions will help us grow calluses, don't they? Why, did they? why were those calluses important? One, to see that Yahweh was a powerful deliverer. Oh, they got to see and experience. When they saw that what God did delivering them, rescuing them out of Egypt, this builds their faith to know that God is a powerful deliverer. Two, we see that God has chosen them for no other reason than to show his glory. Uh, listen to that. It wasn't because they were amazing. They were grumblers and complainers and idol worshipers. God didn't choose them because they were prettier or smarter or wealthier or more important. None of those things. God didn't choose them for that. He simply chose them because he loved them. Do you ever think about that for yourself? I do. I think, God, you could have called anybody to this church. You could have picked so many people to come here and to do what I get to do. You, even beyond that, you could have picked anyone to love you and to get to serve you just to be your child. You could have picked anyone. And you loved me. You picked this wackadoodle. You picked me. God chose them, not because they were something. They were wackadoodles. He chose them because he loved them, and he wanted to pour his glory and use them for his glory. Three, he chose them to display God's provision. 
God displayed his provision for his people over and over again. He showed them that he was faithful and he would provide. He let them, he changed their circumstances, allowed them to wander through the wilderness for 40 years. He allowed them to do this for 40 years so that he could show he is their resource. He didn't let them live in large cities where there was surplus, where there was markets and stores. He he brought them through the wilderness to show them he's a great God and he's faithful and he can take care of them. This last thought, to exemplify God's victory over sin, the worst slave master of all. What a beautiful thought that he did all this to show us that he is God. He is, has victory over all. I, I wonder too, one thing that we're gonna do as we walk through this study is we're gonna look for Jesus. Now, some would argue that Jesus isn't in the Old Testament. I, I would say they're wrong. There's, there's foreshadowing, there's prophetic notes all throughout the Old Testament that point to Jesus. In every one of these stories, I'm gonna try to remember how do we see Jesus? Where do we see Jesus displayed in this story? Not just a God shot like what we do in the Bible recap, but can we find Jesus at work in any of these stories? Are there any parallels? Are there anything? And today, even as I was, as I was in my office, I was thinking through, what are some of the parallels that I see to Moses? And I thought I'd just give you an opportunity. Corey, do you mind grabbing a mic? Oh, you're so ready. Do you see any parallels between Moses and Jesus? <coughs> You'll, once we get start, you'll get it. Let, Corey, let's go to Linda, and then we'll go to Carla. You don't want to... He had a beard. Okay, we're not going to Linda. Don't start with Linda. <laughs> Carla. Carla had a thought. When Jesus was born, King Herod tried to kill all the baby boys. When Moses was born, the Pharaoh... They both survived infanticide, didn't they? Like, what a profound similarity. They both survived a death decree by a wicked ruler. There's another similarity in there between that part of the story, yeah. Egypt plays a part in both of those stories, right? God delivers his people from Egypt. Now, so I guess this isn't a parallel. It's just a neat correlation. God delivers them from slavery to Egypt, but God delivers Jesus into Egypt. Remember, it was his parents' flight to Egypt that actually saved Jesus as a baby from the maniac ruler. Yeah. I don't know if this is like, I don't know, but both Moses and Jesus were like, Okay. Good, good. That's good. Hold your horses, Carla. Both Moses and Jesus spent time in the desert. Okay, that's good. That's one of the thoughts I have too. Moses crossed the Red Sea and he spent 40 40 years wandering the desert. Jesus crossed the Jordan and he spent 40 days in the desert. Remember being, during his temptation. Back to the back to the baby thing. Think about this. Moses his mom places him in a basket made of straw and pitch. She creates this basket. And then where's Jesus? Jesus is born. He's placed in a manger, which is lichen, like a basket lined with hay. Just kind of a neat similarity. What other thoughts? Royalty, too. Think about this. I mean, even just we stay at, the, stay at his birth. Moses is visited by royalty, isn't he? The... Pharaoh's daughter comes and rescues him from the water. Jesus is visited by the wise men from the east. I, that's kind of cool. What else? Both the large groups of hard-headed people. Oh, come on. 
leading, both led large groups of hard-headed people. I would say hard-headed and hard-hearted. Yeah. Both performed miracles. I, I love that God's covenant was first given to Moses, wasn't it? And God's covenant is finalized in Jesus. Corey. All the people. Say that again. All the leave the people, hard the people. Yeah. Yeah. Both. Oh, that's good. Both would would leave that group of hard-headed, hard-hearted people to go pray. Moses does it in what we call the tent of meeting. I can't wait to talk about that. The tent of meeting. Jesus so often goes off by himself in his own sort of tent of meeting. What else? Oh, Matt. Matt's got his hand up. Let's hear. One thing that I find interesting is that the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God. Yes. And Jesus, the woman called adultery, was writing his finger uh -huh. her. So That's good. Who was saying that he was writing pretty much the Ten Commandments? Some people, yeah. That's cool, the finger of God. Think about the number 12 for a second. Anything significant or symbolic in the number 12 between both Jesus and Moses? 12 tribes and 12 disciples. 12 tribes and the 12 disciples. Even the 12 spies that Moses sends out into Canaan to scout out the land. And Jesus chooses 12 people to be not his spies, but his agents, his world-changing agents. Anything else you see? Days in the desert for 40 years. 40 is God's number of completion. Yeah, yep. Uh, not the same, but still a neat con uh, contrast. Moses turns water to, to blood, and Jesus turns water to wine, doesn't he? And what is that wine symbolic of? It's symbolic of his blood. Not, not building a doctrine around anything like that, not trying to have some new creative teaching, just a neat similarity that we see in Scripture. Kimberly. So when Moses was born, his, so when Moses was born, his mother saw that he was a beautiful child and hid him for three months. And then Mary also, like, after all, like, the shepherds came and everything was happening, she, like, pondered in her heart and, like, hid in her heart, like, everything yeah. was just happening. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Moses brought the Israel, the most basic of all of these observations, Moses brought the people out of slavery in Egypt. And like we started the whole night, Je Jesus brings us out of slavery to sin, right? Any other thoughts before we move on? So with... Uh, celebration of Passover. So when Moses pays, uh, spread uh, a lamb's blood over the doorpost, yeah. he uh, will save that house. And uh, Jesus being the sacrificial lamb on Passover, his blood on the post of the cross. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? I love that. We, we see, too, that um, Moses is the author of the law. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Just so, much, so many beautiful similarities, comparisons there. Um, and, and so, like I said, we're going to look for Jesus. When we're reading through Exodus, we're going to see, do we see... Do we see any foreshadowing? Do we see any similarities? Anything that's supposed to point us to Jesus on this side of the cross as we read through Exodus with a different lens. Where do we see Jesus? So that's where we're going to go uh, starting next week. And I'm excited. I hope that you are excited by this. Can I encourage you to get a little notebook? Can I encourage you? I'm going to have this same type of handout each week. Um, and I would say, I will three-hole punch it if you bring a notebook, but I, I keep all of mine together so that I can, I, I've just got a running notebook that I'll just keep adding from week to week. So I just want to challenge you to, um, to bring that. So 
here's what we're going to do now. We're going to stop me talking, which you can all say amen if you like. Amen. And we're going to <laughs> we're going to kill the life.